So hello everyone. In this video, uh, we will start with a new topic, which is the modeling of time-dependent uh, problems. So today, uh, we'll, uh, or in this video, I will talk a little bit about the phenomenological material behavior and constitutive modeling. So in general, uh, how different materials might, be, might behave. And we'll focus at the end of this video on the solution of uh, a Maxwell device. Let me start by giving you like uh, some practical example how we uh, like um, uh, uh, how we explain or, or how we classif uh, classify the behavior of certain material. So these pictures uh, are from our uh, own work from our laboratory, and we were uh, investigating the behavior of elastomers. So elastomers uh, they are a special type of rubbers, and they have they show viscous behavior, but uh, we want to measure this ourselves. So we have taken this uh, like a, a specimen. We cut this in this form, like we call this bone-shaped uh, specimen, and we put it uh, in, in a uniaxial uh, testing device. So we fix it from the bottom and the, from the top. And uh, this material would be used for uh, biomedical applications. Uh, so it should be tested uh, under certain conditions, like temperature close to body temperature, 36, 37. Uh, humidity should also be uh, maybe 100 percent and you see here in the testing device we have optical tracking systems we have uh, also uh, like a load cell we can measure the load we can measure the, uh, uh, the displacement and so on uh, in this test we applied uh, like displacement control so we applied displacement we measure the strain and then we have looked at the stress as an output um, this is uh, then the input. So we applied stepwise some displacements. So the strains can be computed thereafter. And uh, so we apply the displacement and we wait a little bit. So time dependent behavior it means the behavior will change by the time. And here we see the stress, uh, sorry, the strain. And then we look at the corresponding stress. So we see the stress increases. And then if we wait a little bit, so we we apply the load, we fix our hands, and then we measure the force which is in our hands. So by the time the, the force gets uh, uh, lower, so it relaxes. So the stress really relaxes, it means it decreases by the time until it reaches like a stable value afterwards, so after a long time. So this uh, the x-axis would be the time and the uh, y-axis would be the, the stress. Now, uh, if we want, we can also uh, block the uh, relationship between the stress and the strain. We usually do this because we want uh, to formulate our relationship between the stress and the strain. In other words, we want to formulate our material model. Such kind of problems uh, can be described using uh, like a radiological model. Um, if we have like complicated um, viscoelastic behavior, we can use, for instance, the, uh, the Maxwell model, so, uh, or it's called the generalized Maxwell model because we have a spring as one branch, it's called equilibrium branch. And then we have several uh, spring dashboard uh, branches, uh, depending uh, on the like, degree of nonlinearity in our material. No worries, we'll, we will be back to such a uh, uh, point so, uh, in, in more details, but I just want to show you some uh, results. So from these experiments, uh, the aim of doing this experiment in our case uh, was mainly to figure out the material uh, parameters. So you see I have a lot of material parameters here because we are talking about three-dimensional behavior, uh, like highly nonlinear viscoelastic behavior. And uh, uh, yeah, we have... Uh, these parameters here, and then after figured out, after figuring out the parameters, we went to uh, our software. We did this in Abacus. We uh, built up uh, models for uh, the samples that we tested, and then we checked if our uh, if our software can track the behavior afterwards. And this is what uh, what we have uh, ended up with. Uh, under tension or under compression, we had uh, several experiments, and these results were, uh, we have published this uh, later. So let's uh, now uh, like uh, describe uh, in concrete words what we want to, from this. So uh, the mathematical modeling of time-dependent material behavior. So the, uh, in this case, it gives rise to differential equations. So when you make uh, when you describe this behavior using mathematical formulation by equations, you will end up with uh, ordinary differential equations. So we have a differentiation with, with respect to the time. 
And most of the cases, uh, you cannot solve this analytically because we maybe have like complicated uh, geometry and also complicated equations. So we have to go for numerical schemes. If you have simple uh, equations, then you can go for analytical uh, solutions. Uh, but in uh, like in softwares, uh, usually uh, or not uh, almost all the time, uh, like uh, in, in finite element softwares, they go for uh, numerical integration schemes. Uh, be, uh, this means in, the, in this context, in the context of uh, time-dependent uh, material behaviors, we will uh, address uh, the issue of differential equations. So how we get these equations, and later uh, later videos we will talk also about the time integration. Uh, now, uh, let's start from a general way, so the phenomenological material behavior and constitutive modeling. So in the first uh, slides, uh, I uh, demonstrated the idea of uh, how we figure out the behavior. So it's a phenomena, so we take a sample in the laboratory and we look how the stress strain, uh, stress strain curve looks like. Uh, this is a phenomena, and then we describe this behavior by equation. So let's... Uh, uh, let's take, for instance, uh, as an example, so it's similar to the one that I showed. Uh, uh, we take um, a bar, like a one-dimensional element almost. It has a section of uh, area A, and we apply a load on it, and we fix it from one side. And uh, what we uh, look at, we look at the behavior at certain, uh, maybe at certain point, or at the total behavior of this bar. So we can compute the engineering strain, which is elong elongation, the delta u, divided by L0, which is the initial length of the bar. Uh, we could also compute the stress, which is the force divided by the, uh, by the area. And we apply like a cyclic load. So we, uh, we uh, like pick up this, uh, like each point we take, uh, maybe it's tension, then compression uh, to zero, and then we, we go in negative. So we take co uh, tension, compression, and, uh, or it's fixed from one, from one side, tension, compression, and then we go back to zero. And we look at the behavior. Is it uh, time dependent? It's, uh, is it time independent? We will see. Uh, we, uh, one kind of, or one class of material responses which can be observed is called the uh, rate independent elasticity. In this case, if we move from zero to one, so if we make tension, we will end up with some certain point, and then we, we go through a line, so it's line. And then when we remove the load or when we reduce the load to be zero, we end up with zero stress strain. If we load in the opposite direction, so we compress our material, then we will go to 0.3, and then if we uh, remove the load, maybe gradually, uh, 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 or suddenly, then we will end up with zero. So this behavior will, will would be rate independent. So if we apply the load fast or slowly, we will get exactly the same behavior. Such kind of uh, material response can be represented by a spring, which is our rheological model. And this is simply the linear elasticity where sigma and epsilon uh, are connected through the elasticity modules. So this is like the one dimensional representation. Uh, we could also have some something very similar. However, we don't have a line between zero and one. We have uh, like a curve, <clears throat> so a polynomial. Uh, in this case, we are talking about nonlinear elasticity. Again, we have a spring because we don't have any dissipation in our, in our uh, material response. Uh, it would be right independent, so the same path will be followed if we apply the load uh, fast or slow. And the relationship between the stress and the strain will be uh, not a line equation, would be a higher order polynomial equation, or would have more than one material parameter. So this is like second uh, obs observation or a possible observation. We could also have a rate independent uh, inelastic material behavior, which could be like rate independent elastoplasticity. Uh, this is uh, one, um, one example. So we have linear elasticity at the beginning, then we have after reaching a certain threshold, like we call this the yielding stress, we start getting increase of the strain at a constant stress, so it's ideal elastoplasticity. The rheological model would be spring uh, with a friction element here, and uh, this is like beyond the, the scope of this because this is also rate independent. We would have exactly the same behavior if we apply the load in, in slow or uh, in a quick way. And uh, as I said, this is the ideal elastoplasticity. 
the uh, like the third uh, possible observation would be the rate dependent viscoelasticity exactly like the experiment that, which I demonstrated today. Uh, in this case, um, if we plot the stress strain curve, uh, depending on the speed that we are applying the load, if we apply this uh, maybe fast, we will get uh, the, this green uh, curve. If we apply it uh, slower, we'll maybe get the, uh, this blue one. If we apply it very, very slow, then we will get the red one, which we call this equilibrium curve. The same if we apply the load and we, uh, we wait a little bit, uh, I mean, if we apply strain, then we have relaxation. If we apply the strain, then we have retardation. And then we will end up at, uh, at this red line, which we call this equilibrium curve. So this kind of material behavior is called viscoelasticity. And then uh, um, one of the possible rheological model would be uh, this one, this pointing Thompson uh, model, where we have a, a branch here, which is called equilibrium branch. It's, uh, it has a stress, uh, sorry, it has a spring with a stiffness E0. And we have another branch, it's called non-equilibrium branch, which has a, a spring and a dashboard uh, in, uh, in series. Uh, now, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, this, uh, or uh, how can we uh, like determine or we feel, we decide that our material behavior is viscoelastic? So we have like two classes of experiments. One is called relaxation and one is called creep test. Yes, it's, the idea is very simple. So for the stress relaxation, uh, as the name says, the stress is relaxing. It means the stress is our output, which, which also means that the input would be the strain. So we either have the input as a strain and the output is, uh, is a stress, or other way around, the input is a stress and the output would be the strain. So for the stress relaxation, so we apply a uh, strain, let's apply this as a step. So we apply the strain and we wait a little bit because we want to see if, if the material behavior is time dependent. So we have to wait. And maybe uh, at the end, we remove this strain. The waiting is between T1 and T2. And if we look at the output, the stress, we see that when we apply the strain, uh, the, uh, we have a jump in the, st in the stress. So we have a certain stress. And then the stress start to relax, so start to reduce it. And then we, uh, we remove the strain completely, we end up uh, at time t. Uh, so uh, uh, we end up with zero at, uh, at the infinity of, of time. So this is a stress relaxation, and roughly. And then we, uh, we have the other test, which, which would be the uh, strain retardation of the creep, which by definition, increase of strain under uh, constant applied stress. So uh, in, in reality, we take our a material and then we apply a load on it, and we we uh, we keep the load uh, like constant. Uh, however, uh, the point where we are applying the the load is not fixed, so it can't move afterwards if the material behavior is time dependent. And this is what we see here: uh, we apply a sudden load and we have sudden response, and then by waiting a little bit, so we wait from T1 to T0. We look at the strain, or uh, more precisely, we look at the displacement, and then we can compute the strain. We see that the, the strain will uh, increases until reaching some equilibrium uh, state. And then if we remove the stress again, we would have like sudden reduction in the strain, and then uh, also time-dependent uh, uh, creep until we get, uh, uh, or yeah, time-dependent uh, reduction in the strain until we, go, we end up with zero. So this is how we observe the time dependency. And uh, the time dependent response, it, uh, it's described on the basis of two devices, the spring, which represents the elasticity. So mainly this sudden response is connected to the presence of some spring. And then we have the viscosity, which is connected to the presence of dashboard. Uh, the, spring, the spring, we have seen this uh, already. It has some stiffness, E. Uh, it's called also Hooke's uh, element. And uh, usually, it's, uh, if we take the linear elasticity, we have uh, this simple constitutive equation. The other element, with, uh, which is the uh, dashboard device, is called also Newton's element. It has some uh, constant, eta, which is the viscosity uh, uh, parameter. Uh, and the relationship between the stress and the strain here, it's a rate uh, relationship because the stress would be equals to this uh, eta multiplied by the strain rate. 
simply the derivation of the strain with respect to the time. And it's also a linear relationship. That's why we call this also linear viscoelastic uh, material behavior. And uh, of course, we, we, uh, we don't use these uh, elements separately. We have to connect the, uh, these uh, like, um, elements in different ways to capture different uh, like viscoelastic material behaviors. Uh, let's uh, talk about some uh, of the combinations. So uh, first would be the uh, devices in a series, which is called then the Maxwell element. Uh, simply, we have the dashboard and the spring here. In this case, uh, it's clear if we apply load here at the boundary, the stresses in the spring and uh, in, in the dashboard would be equal. So sigma hook equals to sigma Newton. Uh, and the total strain would be the sum uh, of the Newton uh, and the hook strains. Uh, we could have a different uh, connection where this could be connected in parallel. So we have the, the uh, in this case, this, the total stress would be the sum of the uh, stress in the uh, hook element and the stress in the Newton element. Um, and the strain would be the same in both elements. We could also have different combinations, which we'll address later. But uh, let's talk uh, also uh, uh, the, about the solution of uh, Maxwell device, so uh, about this one. We will talk later about the solution of uh, Kelvin model, so the second one, and also we'll have other combinations of these elements so that we can also discuss this uh, in, in later lectures and also in the, in the exercise. Okay, so uh, what would be the solution? The solution would be to find a relationship between the total stress and the total strain. Let us, uh, let's start by the kinematics. The kinematics, it's, it means here the strains. As I said, it's the total strains would be the elastic strain plus the inelastic strain. And then we can take the time derivative of this. So we put numbers to this equation so that we can refer to them later. And then we have the equilibrium. Uh, the, st uh, the stress in the spring and the dashboard are equal. This is our third equation. And then we have the constitutive relations. So we have two constitutive relations, one of the, uh, related to the spring, this one, and one related to the dashboard. Now we apply some reformulation. We uh, plug uh, equation number four and five in equation number two. And then we, uh, we have this uh, equation, which includes the stress rate, the stress, and the strain rate. This is an ordinary differential equation. This is what uh, I meant when, at the beginning when I said we will end up with some differential equation which we have to solve uh, numerically or analytically. Now we have uh, like simple problems. Maybe you can go for an analytical solution. So as I remark, equation six, so this one, is a differential equation that can be solved for a given uh, strain function. Now let's give an, an example. So a, a certain strain function as an example, so consider a relaxation test. So as I said, stress relaxation test, it means the input would be the strain. And we apply a sudden displacement or strain as an input for solving the stress. So let's take this strain. So uh, at time equal to zero, so T zero, we put a jump in the strain. So suddenly we put E zero, and then we keep this constant. It means our input is this strain zero if t smaller than t zero, so in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, range, and it would be uh, constant e zero if t uh, greater than t zero, so in this range here. It means uh, if we take the time derivative of epsilon, uh, so epsilon dot, it will be then zero. Uh, so how we can compute the stress as an output? Um, if we, uh, so we have epsilon dot equals to zero. So if we recall the equation number six, so I'll go back to number six. So this one, we put epsilon zero, uh, sorry, epsilon dot equals to zero. So we have uh, this equation and we want to integrate this equation uh, under these conditions here. Uh, one of the ways to do it, so we can integrate it directly, but we, the best way or the easiest way in this case, because we have very simple problem, is to propose a fundamental solution. So we propose a solution to be of the form uh, sigma equals to A exponential lambda T. So it's a function. It has uh, its exponential function. It has two unknowns, which are uh, A and lambda, which we have to determine uh, based on the given initial conditions. So um, 
Uh, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, A and lambda have to be determined thereafter. So uh, first we said at t equals to zero, we have this jump in the string. So we have a jump at t zero, we have uh, epsilon uh, zero. It means the total strain, which uh, would be then uh, equals to e uh, epsilon zero. And this is then equals to the elastic strain. So this is the, the first jump. It means when I apply the load uh, or, the, or the strain, uh, only the spring will deform at the beginning, but because the dashboard, it needs some time to, to deform uh, and it's not deformed yet. That's why the whole strain now is connected to the strain in the spring, because this is a sudden response. Now we put t equals to zero in our uh, uh, like a proposed solution. So zero will be multiplied by lambda, the exponential of zero will be then uh, one. It means at, at the very beginning, t, uh, t equal to zero, sigma the stress would be equals to, uh, to A. And also the, st the stress in this case, because uh, we have no uh, deformation in the dashboard, uh, or actually it's all the time, so the, the, the stress in the uh, spring and in the dashboard are equal. So uh, we would have uh, sigma equals to E multiplied by uh, epsilon elastic which is, again, it's equals to uh, epsilon zero at t equals to zero. From uh, comparing these to each other, we figure out that A, so our first constant, is equals to um, E multiplied by epsilon uh, zero. So epsilon zero is known, and E is elasticity, which is a parameter, so it's already known. So uh, this first uh, constant is already determined. What remains is to determine uh, lambda, and what we do is uh, we first take the time derivative of our solution, a proposed solution, so take the time derivative of this. Then we have uh, sigma dot equals to A lambda exponential lambda t. Now we can put this in our uh, uh, equation number seven. So again, in, in this equation here, so we have sigma dot and have sigma. Now we, uh, we can put this in this equation here. And we apply uh, some reformulation. So if we reformulate this, it will be A multiplied by exponential lambda t multiplied by lambda plus uh, E divided by eta equals to zero. We have two terms equals to zero, where, which are multiplied to each, uh, by each other. We know A is not a zero, and the exponential function cannot be zero. It means the only uh, way to, uh, to have this equals to zero is to consider this term to be equals to zero. So lambda would be from this uh, equals to minus E divided by eta. With this, we have determined uh, the two constants, A and lambda. We block them uh, in, in the proposed solution, and then we have a closed form a solution of the stress. Uh, we can uh, plot the relationship between the like the uh, or or the uh, I mean between the time and the stress. So we 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 can plot the uh, time history of the stress, and we see here just to to check if we put t equals to uh, zero. So at the very beginning, then we end up with sigma equals to e uh, epsilon dot. So this is uh, what we have here, and this is the stress which is uh, stored in the spring. Now, uh, if we uh, wait uh, infinitely, so if we put t uh, equals to infinity, we see that uh, this stress will end up with uh, zero. And this is, uh, of course, a nonlinear uh, function. And we see that uh, this, um, the inclination or the speed of relaxation depends on this uh, eta divided by E, so the uh, viscosity parameter divided by elasticity modulus. And we call this as the relaxation time. And this is, a, it depends on the material that you are considering, you will have different uh, relaxation time. Okay, so with this, I'm at the end of, of this video. We will meet each other on Monday for uh, more details. And uh, in next uh, video, we'll talk, we'll continue with this topic. We'll consider other uh, models and uh, we'll also consider uh, the time, uh, time discretization. So thank you so much and uh, see you then.